Have you ever watched a movie that you disliked only to have a completely different experience on a later rewatch? Maybe you watched a comedy while in a bad mood or a drama that you didn't have the attention span for at that moment. I like B horror movies, but when I watch them, I immediately approach them with an attitude of mockery. Even if they're able to succeed at what they're attempting, I won't grant these films any measure of credit because my only interest is in jest. I think this phenomena is in some part responsible for the reputation that Forspoken has garnered. That isn't to say that there is no fire to explain the smoke. Forspoken has its flaws. It actually has quite a few of them. I'll address these flaws, but by the end of this video I hope to sway you that this game's strengths outweigh them and it merits a second look by some who passed it by. The dialogue was criticized by many before the game was even released. Later, when more people got their hands on the game, they went into the game expecting to hate the cringe dialogue, and the well was already poisoned. In my opinion though, the real problems with Forspoken are things that I have seen less people address. Let's start with the first 45 minutes or so of the game. Most of the dialogue that's been most heavily mocked was in this segment. I'm going to finish off this video with glowing positivity, but first I think it's best to acknowledge why many people mocked this game or outright dismissed it as being bad. I will be the first to admit that I love having the unpopular opinion and advocating for media that is heavily criticized, but if I ignored this game's flaws entirely, then this video would appear slightly dishonest. Now I need to admit something to you. I went back and captured the opening hour of gameplay, but I did not record the entirety of my 50 hours of this game. I was just playing this game for fun, and I have 3 terabytes of footage from other videos that I didn't make. As such, I'll intersperse this video with footage that I captured mostly in the open world, but I may not have corresponding footage for every point I make after this opening segment. So the game starts as our protagonist Frey sits in a courtroom to meet with a judge to plead not guilty to grand larceny. She is faced with some documents on the table demonstrating that this isn't her first brush with the law. Some of the documents demonstrate that Frey is an orphan who is found in the Holland Tunnel. I'll let this conversation with the judge play in full so you can get a feel for what the dialogue sounds like. Is that who you really are? No, it's just I needed the cash for... <sighs> Never mind. Sooner or later, you're going to have to start taking accountability for your actions. Are you familiar with the Persistent Felony Offender Law, also known as the Three Strikes Law? Wait, you can't do that. I never hurt anyone. Just yourself. You have two previous felony thefts, and with this new one, your grand total will be three. This could put you away for a very, very long time. You have so much potential. I, I, I can do so much more with my life. I I I'm a smart girl with a bright future. I was going to say you have so much anger and resentment in you, I'm not sure you'll ever amount to anything at all. Truth hurts. But, in the holiday spirit, I'm going to give you an early present. Try not to piss it away. I'm going to release you under the condition you serve 120 hours of community service. Thanks. You won't regret it. Next time you end up in front of me, I will not be as lenient. We clear? Good. You're free to go. Frey, one more thing. Happy almost birthday. It's not too late to start using your gifts to help others. Once outside of the courtroom, Frey counts her blessings that she escaped the law this time. She notices a woman has dropped her phone and promptly returns it. These early moments are very heavy-handed in establishing Frey's character, and that hand will only become heavier in the coming moments. She heads home to check in on her cat, and on the way she's confronted with the Japanese game developer's version of Street Toughs. Things escalate quickly. Lisa? Really? I thought she was Lisa. That's Chrissy! Huh. Well, in my defense, you don't really look like a Lisa. Uh, oh, where is it? Uh, Oh, I don't have it, all right? There were complications. Not like I wanted to get caught stealing the car, but here we are. We don't like complications. You are running out of chances. 
Yeah, I've been hearing that one a lot today. Get the car back. It's not that easy. It's been impounded. I'm not so special about this car anyway. It's none of your damn business. Our boss, Mr. Giggin, is very unhappy. So unless you get it back, one of us is gonna be in a lot of pain. Do I get to pick? <laughs> Keep joking. We will leave your body in this fucking alley, and I promise you, no one is gonna miss you. No. Okay. Okay, fine. We'll just tell your boss, Mr. Chicken. Giggin. 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 All right, g g quick, g giggin, quick, gig. I, I just tell him. I, I, I need some more time. But, but for now, here's some collateral. I really did like this game, but this intro is very silly. You're quickly introduced to the parkour system as Frey is forced to make a tactical retreat. She leaves them in the dust and escapes into another alley. Good thing she has lots of pockets. With the street punks evaded, Frey finds her way home. It's revealed that she's living in an abandoned building. You can poke around her humble abode and find an old copy of Alice in Wonderland. Again, subtlety is not this game's strength. She has a shoe collection, which she clearly cherishes. A box contains more remnants of her mysterious beginnings. She finds a box of cat food that she claims Homer, the cat, isn't fond of. But it's all she has. Then you are immediately shown her bag of ill-gotten money. Bitch, you can afford to buy your cat food that it likes. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. This is her escape plan fund. All Frey wants to do is get out of New York and get a fresh start. When Homer appears, Frey's softer side is revealed. Hey, Homer. I'm sorry I'm late, I know. You miss me? Oh, well thank you, but my birthday isn't for another few days. Tell you what, I almost forgot. I've been so busy recently. Oh, well, you know. Important things to do. Riding court, slaying dragons. I'll let you in on a secret, but I'm a pretty big deal. <laughs> Real big deal. Everybody needs me. We are getting out of this city, Homer. Away from the assholes, the garbage, the cops. I, I thought it was just enough to get us started. Yeah. I promise we'll go somewhere that loves cats. Even ones like you. I just can't wait for clean air, bright skies. No more chases, no more cops. No more fights. <sighs> Tomorrow. One more sleep, and we are out of here. <sighs> Can't wait to be in the other place with this. Frey awakens with the whole building on fire. She looks down at her money bag and insists that she has to find Homer first. You cannot pick this bag up. I don't care who you are. You are grabbing that bag and hunting for your cat. You literally have two arms. This plot contrivance kills me inside. Once she finds Homer, she looks back to find her escape fund engulfed in flames. Surprising no one. 
Upon leaving, it's revealed that the street toughs are responsible for this event. Pocket sand. No! Days later, Frey has nothing left. She sits by a dumpster, contemplating her options, and decides to take the most difficult path. I don't care who you are. You can sympathize with Frey having to give up her one remaining friend. Plus, it's so fluffy. No longer with the means to take care of herself, much less her cat, she gives Homer to the only person she knows capable of doing so. Frey sits atop the hall and tunnel on Christmas, which is also her birthday, by the way, cursing her mother for abandoning her and pondering her next step. She needs to get a plan to get her life back in order and recover her friend. Suddenly, a burst of light appears and focuses her gaze on a nearby window. Inside the abandoned room is a brilliant gold trinket. I mean, wow. Whoa. <laughs> hmm. What? Oh. Oh. <sighs> She watches helplessly as the portal that took her here closes behind her. Almost immediately, she's introduced to her newest sidekick. Whoa. Where on earth is this? I see ya. Who's there? And technically not this. Well, not what you would call this, anyway. I swear to God, asshole, show yourself! Show myself? I've shown. I'm showing. I can't get more shown to show myself in tears. Where are you? Right here, at the end of your arm. The thing that you so fruitlessly tried to remove. Oh, hello, yes. Oh, perhaps you're smarter than you look. No. Yes. N no. Yes. You, the one talking to me right now, are this... Cuff? Cuff? It's a bit reductive, isn't it? Cuff? Gauntlet, maybe. Van Brace. Oh, Van Brace. Van Brace. Yeah, no, it's definitely Van Brace. No, no, no. This is batshit bananas! Ah! And yet, it's the truth! You stop your hurting me now! Seriously? No. But what you're doing is completely futile. How is this happening? Well, what were you doing before this was happening, hmm? I was... Doesn't matter. Still here. Whoever is doing this, stop. This is one sick joke. I am out of here. You can't run away from me. I am literally attached to you. Why don't we settle down a bit and talk about ourselves? Talk about our interests in life, perhaps. I am not hearing this. This is all a bad dream. <clears throat> be careful not to trip on anything. You can also see things? This cannot be fucking real. Listen to me, Frey. How the hell do you know my name? We are bonded. Bonded? What do you mean, bonded? Why is this happening? This is... No. On bond. On bond now. As you can see, you're stuck with me. And I with you. And only you can hear me. I can only imagine how I might react to a talking Vambrace that revealed itself to me only after I was warped to an alternate medieval fantasy world, but Frey handles it somewhat in the same way I would handle it, I would suppose. Moving further into this dilapidated castle, Frey and Cuff are confronted by a sick-ass fantasy dragon. She has to get something to eat and meet someone who will help her escape this place, so she's forced to push forward out and into the world of Athia. 
In her first real conversations with Cuff, you can get a sense of the type of relationship they'll have. Who are you? I am what you see. Lovely, and I suppose you'll tell me more if I answer your riddles three? Uh, I don't follow. Frey is from New York, and the Van Brace reveals he was also from another world who ended up in Athia. He was not always in the form of a bracelet. Frey doesn't understand this world, and he does not understand the world that she came from. You get it. Fish out of water stuff. In front of the castle, Frey gets an introduction to some of the local fauna, and it's none too friendly. Cuff shows his usefulness and shields her from damage, and she fends off the foe with newfound magical powers. And now for the most picked at segment of dialogue I've seen for this game. Did I just do that? Well, definitely with my assistance. I did not just do that. We did. I just moved shit with my mind. Perhaps our connection has somehow awoken some abilities. I just moved shit with my mind. I just keep hearing I, I, I. I just moved shit with my freaking mind! <laughs> Yeah, okay, that is something I do now. I do magic, talk to sentient cuffs, kill jacked up beasts. You know what? I'll probably fly next. Now you're just being ridiculous. Oh, that's too far. Good to know there was a line. If you could just master these new abilities, with my help, of course. Um, did you not just see me take out that gnarly beast? Oh, bring it, you mangled monsters. And now I've gone over the introduction of this game in pretty excruciating detail. I'll detail what I believe the actual problem is here. If I told you the premise of this game is that a homeless woman from Hell's Kitchen finds a cuff that whisks her away to a medieval fantasy realm where she'll be forced to help the populace in order to find a way home, you might be mildly intrigued, at least. However, the opening is beyond heavy-handed. She's an orphan. She's a felon. She's homeless. Although she commits crimes, she also shown to have compassion for others, like the woman who lost her phone. She leaves her bag of escape money behind because she only cares about her cat, even though no sane individual would do so. There are too many contrivances in this early setup to ring true for many, even though there are moments that could easily breed sympathy in the, in the player, like her longing for a fresh start while talking to her cat, or when she's forced to give Homer away. The dialogue will continue to be a mixed bag for the entirety of the runtime. For me, though, Cuff and Frey actually provide the highest quality of the dialogue in the game, in spite of the game's reputation. The main actors in the story continue to be well-voiced and directed. Well, directed. I've seen many people pick apart her early conversations with Cuff, and it's not what bothered me about this opening. I like this game, but I still found it easy to mock the pocket sand or the introduction of the street gang. It's kind of silly. If I was suddenly dropped in this new fantastical world and I was introduced to a talking cuff which granted me superpowers, I might say some ridiculous things as well. That really isn't any measure of concern to me. To each your own. If this is too much for you, right at the start, fair enough. In my opinion, the actual story of Forspoken is one of its strengths though. The world of Athia has some interesting lore and by the midpoint of the story I was invested in finding out about Frey. She may have been raised as an orphan, but she didn't suddenly come to be in the Holland Tunnel. She has parents somewhere. Who are they? Where are they? How the story is told, however, is a problem. Many of these cutscenes feel so fractured and strange because they're directed poorly. Let me show you something. All right, so usually in traditional media, they utilize heavy use of a shot reverse shot format, right? So you have two people in a conversation, one person speaks, the camera cuts, other person speaks, camera cuts, back to the other person. So I'm gonna show you a traditional format. Obviously this is low tech, but um, I'm gonna show you the comparison between a traditional shot reverse shot and whatever the fuck Forspoken is doing. My father studied the Taranas. If you find his tomes, they might have information to lead you home. Where might I find these tomes? He was a member of the Cognitions Guild, and they'd likely be in his tower. I'll start my search there. Thank you. My father studied the Taranas. If you find his tomes, they might have information to lead you home. Where might I find these tomes? 
He was a member of the Cognitions Guild, and they'd likely be in his tower. I'll start my search there. Thank you. Traditionally, I'm used to seeing fade-ins and fade-outs punctuate the end of a scene or to initiate a new one. For Spoken fades in and out constantly in at least a strange, staggered dialogue. It does not matter how well these scenes were initially directed and acted. It makes every conversation told in this style feel wooden and unnatural. Even the standard NPC conversations have the pace of an old PS1 game that's loading voice lines off of a CD. This is a game where I can fast travel almost instantly from any point of a giant map, but I can't get two characters' lines to load next to one another. I took to pushing the dialogue forward manually as time progressed, and if you time it right, the conversations almost begin to feel like they're occurring between two humans instead of fighting jukeboxes loading tracks. All that buildup was really just so I could acknowledge that the game has shortcomings in its dialogue, but the writing was never actually the major point of concern for me. Then there's the gulf in voice acting that lies between the main characters in Forspoken and the smaller characters or random NPCs. Some of this material is top tier, legitimately top tier. They got Deborah Wilson after all. Councilwoman Ballette, are you going to let this stand? No. Jenesh, your behavior has brought disgrace upon this council. As of this moment, I am relieving you of your seat. Take him. If you speak to the children in town or some of the random passerbyers, then you might find an almost PS2 level of voice acting. Plus, they do that thing where they put a random voice on a person that is a complete mismatch for the way the character looks. Nothing new for our little friends, I'm afraid. Ever get the feeling you're forgetting something? No more books to trade, I'm well, afraid. Exactly. Maybe Some one sort. day. <laughs> it's very... I wanted them as a memorial for someone, you see? And she'll be more than happy with what you've given me. Thanks again. It is wild how big the divide is between the good and the bad with this game. Another valid criticism at the time of its launch was the technical state of the game. I cannot speak to the PS5 performance, as I don't own one, and I don't plan to. On PC, it would appear that at launch time, the game had myriad issues. I'm happy to say that the game now runs amazingly. On a few occasions, there was maybe a brief hitch or two of traversal stutter, but that wasn't a regular occurrence. Almost enough to where it was like, was something else happening on my computer? It mostly maintained its frame rate with very little deviation, and it also loaded quickly and spared me from loads while fast traveling, as I mentioned before. I may have an Omega PC, but compared to most modern releases I've been playing lately, Forspoken runs decisively better than most. Now, I'm not Digital Foundry or some font of knowledge on the way games are made, but one remaining technical issue in my eyes seems to be with the lighting and shadow system in the game. I have a beastly computer, so I was able to run this game maxed out, ray tracing included. Even on max settings though, it would appear Forspoken has never heard of soft shadows. Usually the closer an object is to the light source, the sharper the shadow will be. As it gets farther away, it will become more soft and diffuse. All of the shadows in Forspoken seem sharp and defined. On top of that, the difference between being in the midday sun and standing in a shaded area becomes similar to the difference in standing on the surface of the sun or the dark side of the moon. It's like light doesn't reflect off surfaces or something. I'll be the first to admit that I'm not an expert on this subject, but it's clear something's going on here. Also, sometimes the shadows on characters can kind of look like bugs crawling all over, but it's very rare, so it's, it's kind of like I'm nitpicking here. The last grievance I have about Forspoken is the gameplay in Sapal, the main story of the game. For the bulk of the game, you're free to speed around the open world. Once you're in town, all of Frey's abilities are removed from your disposal. I'll have positive things to say about the actual design of the city itself, but the gameplay is hurt by Frey's return to human capabilities. Sapal is pretty large. It can be time consuming running around from point to point within the city. In a normal game, it probably wouldn't even bother me, but in Forspoken, the contrast between in-town movement and her movement in the open world is drastic. Cuff tells Frey in an offhand remark that she shouldn't use her magic because he doesn't want her to scare the normies or something. All of your quest givers and NPCs reside in Sapal. 
The bulk of the story and cutscenes are told from within the confines of the city. It's the only city that hasn't been overtaken by the break, a corruption that has engulfed the whole world. As I described before, the NPC dialogue has its problems already. Now on top of that, you're impatient because you're so much slower than you become acclimated to. It means that even someone like me, who is a story lover, was less inclined to engage with those story beats with the same enthusiasm that I might otherwise be inclined to do. It might make sense at the beginning of the story where the civilians of the city are skeptical of Frey as someone who's entered their city through the break. Eventually though, Frey's capabilities and intentions become clear through the story and it makes no sense to restrain her here. So I just spent a whole bunch of time talking a bunch of shit on this game. But I set up this video saying that the game's strengths outweighed its flaws for me. Forspoken takes a while to open up, but once it does, it has a forward momentum that kept propelling me forward, and I found myself investing more time in it than I ever expected to. I wanted to come back. So the cutscenes are directed poorly, which is a shame. But the story is actually really cool. After Frey's early encounter with the dragon and the creatures outside the castle, there's a storm which seems to shatter every native form of wildlife. This is the aforementioned break that has broken the world into pieces. She finds her way into the city of Sepal where she gets a not so pleasant welcome. She's taken in front of yet another courtroom of sorts and the parallels to her life in New York are immediately apparent. No matter which world she's in, she's always an outsider. The court sends her to a tower for the crime of trespassing through their lands, but really it's because they fear her as someone who traveled through the corruption. A friendly face named Auden Keen breaks Frey out of her prison cell and then informs Frey that her father, Robian Keen, studied the types of portals that sent Frey to Athia. Quid pro quo, Clarice. Auden asks Frey to investigate the last known location of her father's journals. If Frey shares any information Robian had on the break, then Auden will share information on the Toranas, or the portals. At this point, Frey is finally free to roam about the open world. This is where the game truly excels, in my opinion. When I first saw my main objective marker pop up, I could not believe how far away it was. This world is massive. I realize now that it has to be. Frey's magic parkour gives her the ability to race around even the most treacherous terrain. It feels so goddamn good to move around. The further you get into the game, the more powers Frey has at her disposal. First, you're simply gliding around, then you unlock a shimmy, which is a precisely timed magic hop that resets your stamina bar. This shimmy remained satisfying to execute even when I was deep in the post game, clearing final objectives across the map. Not only does it allow you to keep up your speed, but the animations are stellar. She later will gain the ability to skip across the top of water bodies or even float for a short period of time. The actual world design of Athia is interesting. Because Frey has such incredible movement at her fingertips, a typical open world could not contain her. With her endgame magic, only the most sheer cliffs or tallest mountains can stop her. It makes you realize how clumsily many open worlds can be designed to stop a player with only human capabilities. Hell, Joel Haver has an amazing bit about chest high walls in his Elden Ring video. Famously, that's all it took to stop you from traversing an area in the bulk of FromSoft titles. Fortunately, the setting is fantasy. Some of the terrain in this open world is staggering. I'll try my best to display this in my footage without spoiling too much of this fantastical world, but it should be noted some of these areas were truly stunning to me. There are quite a few progression systems in this game. Collecting mana around the game world or leveling up can allow Frey to unlock new spells. Using Frey's magic parkour systems use the stamina, and these mana pools also have a fringe benefit of refilling the stamina gauge, so they're often placed strategically to lead you to clear large swaths of the map without having to slow down to recharge our magic. There's a meta game here that can be played to maintain speed throughout the world whilst keeping Frey's stamina from exhausting. The spell tree by the end of the game is huge. Most games with magic have pretty limited imagination in regards to their spells. I was surprised to realize that even when you unlock a fire related branch of the tree, there is no prototypical fireball. I was impressed with the imagination shown in many of her spell options, even if you settle on a few favorites by the closing credits. You can research a chosen spell if you find a bookcase, 
What this amounts to is succeeding at pre-established challenges for the spell you choose. Success in the challenge unlocks a bonus of some type for that spell. Usually movement abilities will have their stamina costs reduced, attack spells will do more damage, support spells will add some additional benefit like longer duration. This has a fringe benefit of forcing you to try different things out and finding out their usefulness. Frey doesn't have stat modifiers like in a traditional RPG where you're leveling her health or magic, etc. The way you bulk up Frey is by crafting on additional modifiers to her gear. Her only two gear options are a cloak and a necklace. Some people will spend a good amount of time tinkering with her gear options and crafting, but it's not a necessity if you're not so inclined. While you explore the world, the ground is littered with assorted materials that feed the loop, and in a move that was heaven sent, she'll grab these materials automatically without any button prompts. This means no need to slow down to collect all the things littering the ground. Whoever made this decision gets a firm handshake from me. On top of her equipped gear, Frey also has nails that she can find that specifically focus on her magical prowess. I can't remember the lore reason for why she needs nail upgrades, but I honestly kind of love the flavor this added to the mostly traditional fantasy world. Let's talk about the points of interest on the map of Athia, the actual tasks littered around the open world. There are belfries, which serve to give you a view of your surrounding points of interest. They aren't a challenge to ascend, as in many other games. It's more about the exploration of the world required to find them. There are two types of monuments, some which just give Frey a stock stat buff, and some which feature combat challenges that give rewards based on performance. Founts of Blessing can be found all over the world. These unlock spells that can't be unlocked through other means. Some of Frey's most potent abilities come through finding these. Once I discovered one of these, I would reconsider old locations I couldn't reach, as I may now have the means to access them. Metroidvania, this game is not. But there are areas that are locked off to you until certain powers are obtained. There are small abandoned villages or old fortifications that might contain a few notes on the greater mythology of the world, or perhaps information on what befell the townsfolk before the break overtook the town. Sometimes you'll find a spire from an old cognitions guild which will provide similar information on the world or its inhabitants. These compounds are often beset by a break storm, which brings extra mutated foes. Once they're defeated, Frey is rewarded with new nail patterns to strengthen her magic capabilities. Possibly the best icons you can find are cat paw prints. At these statues, one can find fantasy cat creatures who serve the former rulers of this world. Just like a cat in our world, they must be approached delicately. Your patience is rewarded with a new friend who will travel the world by your side. When you befriend one, you're given a whimsical biography of each cat, usually with some silly reference to cat behavior. When you stay in a safe house, every familiar that you've befriended will join you. When all these familiars are recruited, the safe houses are crammed with cats. This is the best reward a person like myself can achieve. I have two kitties and waking up surrounded by a bunch of magical cats with wings was so goddamn charming to me. This is clear and obvious cat exploitation, but I don't care. Kitty familiars for the win. Let's talk about labyrinths. They're essentially challenge dungeons. Usually there will be a couple of rooms filled with common foes, a few splits with some goodies, including crafting materials and mana, and then a final room with a boss in it. Every labyrinth yields a new cloak or some details on the greater Athia mythology. There are a couple that are a long prolonged challenge, but most of them aren't more than 10 or 15 minutes to complete. That's actually one of my favorite things about this game. Most of the open world activities in Forspoken are brief bursts of action or story. There's something to be said for the feeling of momentum to ticking all these boxes. The best open world games give you this sense of progression. We all know those games where you say to yourself, I'll just do this one more thing. Then you find yourself shutting things down hours later after completing many more tasks than you had any intentions of doing. I'd grown tired of open worlds, but I got a kick out of the quick bursts of combat followed by a flowing traversal system finding the next small challenge over the horizon, collecting mana and materials along the way. It's a good loop. This open world was far from tiresome to me. You might note that none of these activities are groundbreaking by any metric. 
This doesn't bother me personally because the basic loop of gallivanting around the world and clearing a combat encounter or, or platforming to a location which grants a mechanical benefit to Frey was all satisfying. I remarked on how good traversal feels. The combat deserves the same glow up. This is the second game with real-time magic combat I played this year. Early in the year, I played Ghostwire Tokyo. I enjoyed that game, even if it has its own set of flaws. One thing is apparent though, Forspoken's magic combat was far more appealing. The animations are fast and fluid. You have several magic trees, featuring a ton of spells. Enemy types have the basic weakness characteristics you've seen in tons of games, but being in real time it feels way more satisfying to swap between different trees and spell combinations on the fly. It's one thing to use lightning to crit a water creature in a turn-based RPG, and it's another to smash a mage with a flaming sword and then quickly lightning bolt a nearby crocodile in rapid succession. As a keyboard and mouse user, I'm not used to a Japanese game developer actually utilizing that control system well. I started the game with a controller and then switched to my keyboard and mouse and never looked back. Looking at the key bindings reveals the kind of depth that the game is actually capable of. On normal difficulty, this game can be pretty easily trivialized as most enemies lack range capabilities. It's definitely possible to keep at range and keep yourself safe from many of these foes. The game tries to make up for this by throwing large groups at you and making many of them very quick moving. I played this game on hard and swapped to normal at times while trying to quickly clear things at the end game. On the harder difficulties, it will behoove you to engage with the full breadth of the combat systems. I spent a lot of time purposely keeping close to enemies. Frey is capable of dodging and jumping over enemies, dealing death from above. Quickly dodging an attack with her magic parkour can proc a higher level of her spells that normally have to be built up over time. Obviously, it's much faster to quickly dodge an enemy and spam a spell at them rather than having to sit there in the back and hold to charge it up. This is riskier than hanging out at the fringe of the encounter, but it's way more satisfying for me personally. I'll be the first to admit that I'm not really great at many games, Forspoken included. But one thing I noticed is that many reviewers at the time of release seem to be deliberately playing the game in the most unfun way possible. It's definitely possible to stay at a distance and whittle away the health of many, even the most powerful boss creatures, but that also doesn't appear to be a very enjoyable way to engage with the game. If you want to acknowledge that it's possible to do this and declare that it's bad design, then that's fair play. I'm more inclined to declare that as an inherent flaw with having a character with magical capabilities fighting fantasy creatures. Unless you just make them all humanoids that can throw a firebolt back at her, maybe? I don't know. Having said all that, if safety is your bag and you want to cheese every enemy in the damn game, I'm not here to yuck on your yum. You do you. What I really want to declare here is that Forspoken's combat is the best real-time magic combat I've personally ever played. I'll admit I haven't played everything. I haven't played Immortals of Avium and some others, but from what I've experienced, this is the most satisfying magic combat around, in a JRPG anyway. This alone makes the game worth considering now that the game regularly goes on a considerable sale and you aren't taking full retail price into consideration. By the way, PS, I just realized that that excludes I haven't played Final Fantasy 16. I don't have a PS5. I'll buy it. Once it's on once it's on PC, I'll, I'll give that a try. Maybe it's way better. I don't know. I'm not going to spoil the whole story as I'm one to do with many of my recaps, but I think expanding on some of the game's lore might solicit some more interest in those who are immediately turned off at the fray dialogue they were exposed to in the promotional materials. They sound especially bad out of context. I mentioned the break, a corruption that's overtaken the land of Athia. The world was not always this dangerous place. The people in Sapal still have reverence and fear of the Tantas. These Tantas were something equivalent to goddess queens, each ruling a portion of Athia. In another lifetime, they were known as fair rulers who took care of their people. Many of the archives found scattered across the world refer to the War of the Reddig. The Tantas fought an otherworldly invading force of these Reddig. They were the only beings capable of this fight at the time. Some of the archives are from the perspective of Athians, some from the Tantas themselves, and some from the Reddig. Although it's clear that the Tantas won this fight, as all the notes on the Reddig are clearly in the past tense, 
It's also implied that they possibly have something to do with the break. Unlike the Reddig, the Tonsas still inhabit Athia, but they're past their glory days. How do you plead? If you plead guilty, they'll execute you immediately. Not guilty. Lies! And yet more monstrous lies! She drowns! No more of this! She dies! What? I thought you said if I pled not guilty, she would kill me! I, uh, wait, I declare a mistrial! A mistrial? That's what the demon said. We must finish such a declaration. Always must we? We must. Then another trial must be called. A trial by water! Yes! A trial by water! <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how long your lies sustain you. <laughs> the break itself is interesting partially because its origins are unclear. The Labyrinth Archive notes hint at some kind of ultimate weapon these Red Egg were on the hunt for. One might assume, after doing a couple of these labyrinths, that the weapon mentioned might have caused it. For most of the game, this is a mystery. The people of Sapal may have varying degrees of quality in their voice acting, but the premise of the last bastion of humanity, surrounded by an aura of corruption, interested me. Some of the children were born here and have never seen outside these walls. One of the side quests that covers the whole map requires taking pictures of the outside world with a smartphone for these children. The practical benefits of the side quest were completely minimal. I did not care about the pittance of experience that I attained for doing this. I was intrinsically motivated by the premise of exposing these children to an outside world they've never been able to experience. They put a surprising amount of detail in the archives, giving you a pretty deep pool of lore to draw from if you get invested. In Sapal, there's a Ballow Tree. It oozes blue ichor and it's shown to have magical qualities. The sap from these trees can repel the break and counter its effects. In one of the archives, it's noted that all the safe houses in the world are created with wood from these trees. A thorough explorer will find information that can fill out the holes in the backstory and the world for Frey. Why did the Red Egg attack? What started the break? Who are Frey's parents? Why was she left unceremoniously in the Holland Tunnel? I'm not going to try and represent this game as the deepest game I've ever played. It's got a clear Alice in Wonderland inspiration and it wears that on its sleeve. But despite its reputation, a lot of thought went into the design of Athia. So Paul was a pain to explore at times. Walking around using Frey's legs like a mere mortal? Is this some kind of peasant joke I'm too magical to understand? However, the design of Sapal was really cool. The city has multiple levels featuring a clear social hierarchy. The upper class reside in the upper city, and the have-nots live in the lower city. One thing that I thought was cool is that there was consideration for how one could provide for a whole city that the citizens were incapable of leaving. The lower city is flanked with a pasture with sheep for meat on one side, and an agricultural farmland on the other. All this safely tucked inside the walls of Sapal. I played lots of JRPGs, so I've been inside a lot of town walls. Not too many of them were as well considered as Sapal. There are clear and obvious signs of distress to this place, but the citizens do their best to live their lives in spite of the circumstances. There are people working the farmland, priests still honoring their tonta, children are still being schooled, traders still trade, and the city even has its own resident bard. When you only have one bard, though, you have to be satisfied no matter the quality of his work. Then allow me to perform. The horrible terror of Preynost. He really needs some help naming this. The sheer white stone gave the city a beacon of hope vibe while surrounded by the darkness of the break. When events in the story occur and bring darkness to the city, the contrast of the literal light and dark successfully set a mood. As Frey completes tasks in the open world, her actions are felt within the confines of the city. That's one of those things that a lot of open worlds don't do. You spend a bunch of hours and then you come back to the city and it's like nothing has changed. Your actions do have consequences and they're demonstrated to you in the city. 
The design of Sapal tells a story on its own, and I appreciated it when I wasn't internally bitching about the walking. I poked at the technical side of the game early on. The lighting and shadows were strange at times, in my opinion. That doesn't mean that I thought this was an ugly game. Quite to the contrary. Much of this game was stunning. Environmentally, the diverse landscapes kept me interested in chasing their horizon. Sheer rock faces, lovely fields filled with verdant greens, surreal sights of floating land masses or a vast ocean at its edge. I thought this game was beautiful. I'm not the type of person to spend a lot of time in photo mode, but those type of people have plenty of reason to use it here. The side quest for taking photos for the children also gives the player an excuse to take a moment to consider the environment around them, and it's clever, especially considering the breakneck pace you're normally traveling at. Opinions on art are subjective. I love the setting of this game and Frey's design. She never stops feeling like a fish out of water, and part of that is that even when she gets clothes in town, she never takes off her beloved kicks or her shirt wrapped around her waist. She brings New York with her, and I think that's good character design. The last thing I want to discuss is Cuff and Frey. I probably should have led with this when I started on with my positivity, but this is going to be where I could see the biggest disagreement with my opinions. I think most people who put a reasonable amount of time in this game could agree that the combat's fun. Most would probably agree that the animations are actually great, and it felt good moving around. The negative sentiment about this game around its launch mainly focused on the conversations between Cuff and Frey. Frey and Cuff will banter with one another as they move around the world. The game now sets the conversation parameters to lower setting than it did at launch. To get that experience, I turned the conversation frequency to high and played most of the game like that. On high, they chat a lot. Or more like, they bicker a lot. Early on in the game, it can make Frey sound like an awful bitter person. She is not an instantly likable protagonist, quite to the contrary. She is selfish and guarded, she trusts no one, and isn't even very kind to Auden, who literally freed her from jail. Based just on the context of what we know from the opening 30 minutes, all this can be explained. That doesn't mean it's a great idea to make your character an irredeemable bitch right out the start of the gate. Having said that, by the end of the story, she does come around. She may have had a bad attitude even in the beginning, but she will do what's right for people. She befriends some of the kids in the lower city and becomes an uneasy hero character. Her intentions with the poor and children make her much more likable early on. Her rocky start makes for a more satisfying arc. I really enjoyed Alo from Horizon Zero Dawn, but realistically, given her upbringing, it doesn't make a lot of sense for her to be so cheery and altruistic. The other factor to consider in these not-so-pleasant interactions with Cuff is that Cuff is kind of an asshole too. He was once a man. Now he's trapped in a bracelet on a young woman who's already bitter about her situation. He second-guesses every choice that Frey makes and lords his magical prowess over Frey at every opportunity. To be honest, early on I was more sour on Cuff than I was on Frey. Many of her snarky remarks to him are just a retort to one of his jabs. They've created a loop of reciprocating negativity. As time goes on, they build an uneasy alliance. It isn't really a friendship, but they need one another. Even though many of these interactions are snippy early on, Cuff is a great replacement for having a narrator. He may not have been from Athia, but he has been here, and he can fill in the backstory for Frey and the player, whilst not requiring the slow walking with the guy on the radio scenario or an overhanging narrator, you know, whispering in your ear. Frey has the ultimate tragic backstory. She spends much of her time focusing on returning to New York, but the truth is, she doesn't have anything to return to there. She's an outsider everywhere. She has no family, no home, no friends, save for Homer. I might be a bit spiteful and selfish if I was put in that scenario. I'm a bleeding heart. I'll be the first to admit it. As an overly empathetic player, I felt bad for the poorly voice acted kids in the lower city who've never seen the world. I felt for the stories of the people found in random settlements around the world who failed to escape the break. Most of all, I felt for Frey. She gets thrown from New York and into the new world she doesn't understand. She is immediately confronted with a dangerous world that wants to kill her. When she finally meets friendly looking faces, 
She's seen as a heretic who came from the break and is thrown in prison. She doesn't have any reason to trust anyone. Why would she be nice to anyone? This world or her last has not been kind to her. When she has an outburst discovering her magic powers, everyone mocked it. The truth is, Freya's lived her life on the fringes of society. She was never important. In Athia, she has literal magic powers. Maybe her response to that isn't totally ridiculous. I spent a long time at the beginning tearing this game down. The flaws in this game deserve to be addressed. I can see why many disregarded this game. I'm not blind. However, I love being a contrarian. I'm inclined to give the game a shot even in the face of a subpar reputation. I'm the type of person who will take the bad with the good. I don't think everyone is willing to give the same benefit of the doubt, and that's also fine. The reason I was willing to put so much effort into a video for this game is because I think it's genuinely interesting and fun to play. I played a lot of games this year. Some were better than this. Baldur's Gate 3 is one of my favorite games ever now. I also played some that were good, but also left me with very little to actually say about them. The fact that Forspoken is so strong in some areas while also being very weak in others made me more intrigued by it. Is this a misunderstood masterpiece? No. It could become one of those games that slowly gains a cult following as the years pass by though. A small group of fans who are attracted to what it was trying to do, willing to see past the game's weak points to find the original intent of its creators. Or maybe they just thought it was sick as hell to conjure a rock and hurl it at a dragon. I really did enjoy this game. I really did enjoy the way this game played. Hopefully I inspired a small measure of respect for a game that has garnered very little. Seeing this game on the worst game list is just silly to me. I played Redfall. That game attempted very little and succeeded in even less. Forspoken may be flawed, but I'd push back on the premise that it's outright bad. Too many things are done too well. Plus it has kitties. Come the hell on, kitties! Sorry about this one. I feel like I said way too much while also saying nothing at the same time. My next long recap will be Final Fantasy VII Remake, probably. I might even get it out before Rebirth. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. In lieu of a recap of Baldur's Gate 3, I might just do an Act 1 recounting for funsies. That game is a bit much for my typical style. Long story short, uh, thanks for watching my video, friends. I uh, decided to interview my cats to ask them how they felt about the obvious exploitation of adorable kitties in Forspoken. They couldn't even look at me. They were obviously so sickened by it. Bright Kitty, what is your stance on Forspoken utilizing kitties to try and draw in customers? Nothing. Camilla Kitty, how about you? Truly a heinous act, right? Yeah. Disgusting.